in today, so I got to do the double duty, so forgive me, guys. Yeah, we will. So, how's everybody doing today after the Chiefs won? I mean, lost. Oh, <laughs> my heart beat peanut butter. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's pray for Teresa real quick, all right? So, and Mackenzie. Where's Mackenzie? She's over there. Yeah, we'll pray for her too, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so. All right, guys. Well, welcome and good morning again. So, good morning. No other place to be, is there? Yeah. Yeah. It's the highlight of my week. I don't know about you all, but it's the highlight of I think about this morning every day of the week. It's just all I focus on. So I am very thankful that that's how I am these days because I didn't used to be that way <laughs> at all. All righty, guys. Before we get started, um, just an announcement. The blessing box did not get put in this week because of the snow, but it is set up to be put in this week. Um, so, well, I didn't see you back there. Oh, hi, Brenda. I can't. I'm sorry. Now I'm recruiting. All right. <laughs> uh, yeah, no doubt. So hopefully it's this week, guys. So um, did I just write how big it was last week? I don't remember. The blessing box is, is about this wide and about this deep. And it's going to be on a post right out here in this flower bed. So. Uh, Lynn said she brought some stuff already. You Where's might explain it? for the ones that haven't been here when you explain. Well, that's true. Okay, so, all right, real quickly here. Um, the Methodist Church is spear, the one on um, across from the fire station is spearheading a project called the Blessing Box. The Blessing Box is a project where strategic locations throughout Chanute will have a freestanding box on the ground, on a post in the ground. And that box is unlocked and is to be stocked with non-perishable food. And it's to be for people who are in need. So people like us who may not be in need can contribute to the box. Or anybody can. It's basically designed so the neighborhood can put stuff in and the neighborhood can take stuff out. Whoever's in need, take it out. And whoever's not in need can contribute. So it's, it's we don't fund the box. The neighborhood does. And we were chosen for the south part of Chanute. So hopefully, not only are we going to be able to help the neighbors out, that's a good thing, right? Yeah. They'll get their little bitty footprints on our property, <laughs> in which I will shackle them or tase them or something. <laughs> <laughs> Just to make sure that they don't go away. Yeah. Exactly. So hopefully that's installed this week. I'm sure it's weather-related and connected somehow, but um, we'll see how it is. Contribution letters. I thought I got everybody a contribution letter. Does anybody not have their contribution for tithing from last year or that? Besides the mortgage. I'll <laughs> email. Yeah. Okay. I will get those if you, if you think you have it, you don't just call me and I can get it to you. Um, I, that's all I got. You guys got any announcements? Who's no? got a praise? Anybody? I got a praise. That I'm here today. <laughs> that I want to be here. That's my praise. That God has fixed you. And that is here today. And oh yeah, Papa's here too. That's definitely a good deal there. He's all happy because Jayhawks won yesterday. <laughs> adorned with more Christian bling than I've seen anybody in the casket. Necklaces, crucifix, the whole nine. You know, you look at it. Um, and you're thinking, wow, this is odd. I mean, I like to see that, right? And then I meet the preacher for does, does this funeral service, and I asked, I said, did you know the guy very well? He goes, no, he was in church twice. So it, do you see the disconnect here, guys? There's a disconnect. So let's pray for those people who are disconnected. They think one thing, but perhaps the reality is something different. That would be my prayer. All right, with that being said, I'm going to open up a prayer, and we'll get to singing, all right? Heavenly Father, I am here today to praise and worship you and hallow your holy, holy name. And likewise, all of us in this room are here to do the same, Father. Please, Father, find our praise and our worship today pleasing to you, because this is all about you, Father. Thank you, Father, for this week you have given all of us. We had whatever we had going on this week, Father, we have ended up here in your presence. And I am thankful, Father, that you have helped us be there. Father, I pray for this neighborhood and the people in here. I, as, we, as we just, every day, every day I just realize how far away these people are separated from you, Father. And I just, I just want to lift them up to you, Father. 
I just want us to corporately lift this neighborhood up to you so they can, when you are penetrating their hearts, when the Holy Spirit is bouncing on their head, they can understand and accept what is going on, Father. Because they're in dire straits. They are absolutely in dire straits, Father. We just, we just want to lift them up, Father. Please don't give up on them. Please do not give up on them. And then finally, Father, I just want to thank you for your plan of salvation, Jesus Christ. The grace and the mercy and compassion you have shown all of us is just unfathomable. It's hard to describe and it's even hard for me to talk about because I do understand exactly how unworthy I am. Father, I thank you for the blood of Jesus Christ. Without that, I have none. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Very nice. Here we go. I think I'll know who it is. Please watch over me as I speak these words. Please make sure that 
I speak truth, and only truth, that I honor you, Father, and that I please you with my words. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Let me just play this video right here. I'm so excited about this video. Can you tell? Mm -hmm. All right. Everybody knows the, the title of the message today, right? Yeah. Fear and Trembling. ไปไปไปไปไปไปไปไปไปไปไปไปไปไปไปไปไปไปไปไปไปไปไปไปไปไปไปไปไปไปไปไปไปไปไปไปไปไปไปไปไปไปไปไปไปไปไปไปไปไ
when I was growing up, and maybe it was the same for you all, it was very common to hear people, other people use words, God-fearing, when they spoke. I heard those words a lot. But we don't hear those words anymore. God-fearing. Do you hear people talk like that anymore? Because you don't, right? So I have a question. Why do you not hear people say they fear God anymore? Why do you not hear that? We don't hear it anymore, friends, because most people are no longer fearful of God. We don't hear it anymore because the world, the world has done what? It has been successful at only talking about God's love, God's grace, and how this good old God, this good old grandpa figure is going to turn his head when his children are disobedient. And a lot of people think when God is not mean enough to judge you to hell, that's the good old God that I want. Because God won't send you to hell, will He? He won't judge you, will He? Most people do not fear God. That's why the seeds are empty. They don't fear Him one bit. If you spend any time studying this right here, any time studying God's written word, and you are intellectually honest with your interpretation, you cannot walk away from this book, this scripture right here, without understanding that God is almighty. And that the fear of God is the foundation, the very underlying foundation for love and obedience. And furthermore, you will also understand it is the foundation for something else called grace. The foundation of grace is fear of God. <clears throat> Excuse me. If that's a true statement, what I just said, if that is a true statement, then doing the will of God must include fear and trembling of Jehovah. It must include it. Now we're told in Proverbs chapter 1 this, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Now friends, if you are to be a believer, a believer who is knowledgeable about God, about Jehovah, and being knowledgeable means you follow Him, then this dynamic, this whole dynamic that we're talking about starts with the fear of God. Now the word used in the original Hebrew scripture for fear is this word right here, and it's called yirat. But it's a special meaning for the word fear. It means a fear for sure, but it means a fear that has priority. So do you understand a, a fear with priority? Brian may have a fear of snakes, but that's not the priority. The fear of God is the priority. That's what Yerat means here. Now, when we, uh, in this particular verse that we just read here, when we make God, we have to understand this, when we make God that priority in our life, when His Word, when this right here, when His Word becomes the purpose of our life, that's when we begin to submit to God and obey Him. And that's the beginning of knowledge. And therefore, if that is true and that is happening, then God is going to equip us all with a different perspective than those who do not believe. And that's a true statement, right? If you belong to Christ, your perspective is different than the world's. The fear of God draws us nearer to Him. It draws us closer to His purposes so we can learn to do the right things that please Him. Fear of God helps us see things from His standpoint, not from the world's standpoint. Fear of the Lord helps us to be kingdom-minded. It helps us love and obey our Father. And it's extremely noticeable to non-believers that when they see us navigate through life, we do it differently than they do because we fear God. People fear all kinds of things, right? They really do. The fear, they fear losing their jobs and being broke. I've done that. They fear being alone. Yep. They fear the pandemic. Sure, you hear people talk about it on TV all the time. They fear government overreach, right? The government's getting in my business, all right? And believe it or not, this is a true statement. Believe it or not, some people even fear snakes. I don't get it, but they do, all right? They fear snakes. Now, the prophet Isaiah does a very great, good job of contrasting the fear of God with fearing things of the world or of man. He uses very strong words to describe this fear. And when we read in Isaiah this, 
You are not to say it is a conspiracy regarding everything that this people call a conspiracy, and you are not to fear what they fear or to be in dread of it. It is the Lord of armies whom you are to regard as holy, and it is He who shall be your fear, and it is He who shall be your dread. Now, we are not to fear anything, Father, or people. If we read this and we follow Scripture, we're not to fear anything but God. We are to be what? God-fearing people. God-fearing Christians. That's why you heard that years ago a lot, because they understood this. In the Bible, there are many God-fearing people. And these people that are God-fearing are considered to be believers. One of those such people that you read about is called Cornelius. He was a believer that we read about in Acts chapter 10. Let's read it real quick about Cornelius. Now, there was a man in Caesarea named Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian cohort, a devout man and one who feared God with all his household and made many charitable contributions to the Jewish people and prayed to God continually. Cornelius, friends, Cornelius in the Bible was a man who was, a, who was very devout to God that we read about. He taught his family to fear God. He gave generously to his fellow man and he prayed constantly. That's what we read in scripture here. This guy right here, this Cornelius guy, is a great example of how a Christian who fears God will live their life. It is a life of devotion to God, of praying always, and giving to those who are in need. The fear of God has been a mainstay from the beginning of Scripture. We find it first mentioned in Genesis regarding our friend Abraham and how he feared God. We read in Genesis 22 this. He said, Do not reach out your hand against the boy, and do not do anything to him. For now I know that what? You fear God. Since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Abraham feared God so much that he was willing to kill his son in obedience to his father. That's how much he feared God. Do you fear God that much? Who in this room would kill their son because they fear God? That's fear, friends. That's a kind of level of fear that we don't know about, right? That is fear. Now, I think it's fair to say that modern Christianity has downplayed the word fear by saying that the word fear doesn't really mean fear. It doesn't really mean tremble. It simply means to show God reverence or respect. That's what a lot of people think fear means. But that is not what you find in Scripture, friends. That's not what this says. If you're intellectually honest, Hosea describes the fear of the Lord as with trembling before a lion. We read in Hosea this. They will walk after the Lord. He will roar like a lion. Indeed, he will roar. And his sons will come trembling from the west. They will come trembling like birds from Egypt and like doves from the land of Assyria. And I will settle them in their houses, declares the Lord. Can you imagine standing next to a lion who starts roaring at you? Do you think you would be feeling reverence at that time? Respect? No. Do you think you'll be trembling with fear? Yes. That's the example. I know for sure I will be on my knees, shaking uncontrolled, be scared out of my mind with terror, standing next to a lion roaring at me. I would not be like, oh, yeah, you're a good guy. <laughs> you love me, right? You won't send me a dog. Have you ever heard of the author C.S. Lewis? Anybody? You have, probably have heard of C.S. Lewis, right? He's the Chronicles of Narnia, very familiar writings by C.S. Lewis. He wrote another book called The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, in which there was a quote where he describes God as a lion. And it seems really accurate to me, so I wanted to uh, present this quote to you real quick from C.S. Lewis. So this is the quote from his book, Out of the Witch and the Lion, or the, uh, I'm sorry, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Asian is a lion, the lion, the great lion. Oh, says Susan, I thought he was a man. Is he quite safe? I shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. Safe, said Mr. Beaver. 
Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe. But he is good. He's the king, I tell you. That's a perfect example of God. Perfect example. People want a safe God. That's what people want. They don't want a God that makes them tremble with fear. Not a God who brings terror. They want to remove God's fangs and His teeth and His roar. They want God that they can cuddle with, right? That's not the God that we find in the Scripture, friends. God is not tame. He is not weak. And He is definitely not safe. He is almighty. It seems like today's Christians are more afraid of Satan than they are God. They see the devil as wild and dangerous, and they see God as tame and meek, a pushover. The Bible tells us to fear God, not Satan. God is dangerous, much more dangerous than Satan, but He is good. God is more terrifying, much more terrifying than Satan, but God is holy. And because of God's holiness, we all should fear Him. Just like it says in Psalms, 96 this. Oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Tremble before Him all the earth. Pretty easy to understand, right? Our disobedience, our sin should cause us to tremble before a holy God. The Bible describes people who do not have fear of the Lord as having no understanding. It says that they have eyes that do not see and ears that do not hear. It also says it is rebellion to not fear God. You are rebellious if you do not fear God. Check out what we find in Jeremiah 5 through 24 this. Hear this now, O foolish people, without understanding, who have eyes and see not, and who have ears and hear not. Do not fear me. Do you not fear me, says the Lord? Will you not tremble at my presence? who have placed the sand as the bound of the sea by a perpetual degree, decree that it cannot pass beyond it, and though its waves toss to and fro, yet they cannot prevail. Though they roar, yet they cannot pass over it. But this people had a defiant and rebellious heart. They have revolted and departed. They do not say in their heart, let us now fear the Lord our God, who gives rain, both the former and the latter, in its season. He reserves for us the appointed weeks of the harvest. It's a common theme in church nowadays to emphasize the grace of God, but neglect the judgment of God. We like to read Bible verses that emphasize the love of God, but ignore the verses about the wrath of God. We have no problem saying God is good, do we? You hear it all the time. But we don't like to think about God punishing people for their sins. We have gotten away from this mindset about punishment and judgment. This mindset that we read here in Psalms. My flesh trembles for fear of you. And I am afraid of your judgments. This is Holy Scripture being talked to us right now. We have gotten away from this mindset as a Christian in Western Christianity. Are people really, truly fearful of God and His judgment? Think about it. Are people really fearful of God and His judgment? Most are not. People who fear God walk according to His commandments, and they do not stray from His word. If you truly fear God, you tremble at His feet every time you sin. Therefore, you would make it a priority to turn around from sin. You would make it a priority, if you really fear God, to repent, because that's what we're told to do, right? The Apostle Paul tells us to work out. Now, we're going to talk about New Testament stuff here. The Apostle Paul tells us to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. Check out what Paul says about this. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but not much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in both you to will and to do good for His good pleasure. Paul's telling us to do this. One of the most popular verses in the Bible might be this one right here in Proverbs. Y'all recognize it. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. 
You all are familiar with that, right? Think about this statement. This statement right here and ask yourself, how is the fear of God the beginning of wisdom? It is because when we fear God, we will do what? We will do wise things that please Him. The fear keeps us from walking around acting like a fool, acting foolish and living in sin. It is because of the fear of God we will do what is right and what is good. When a person fears God, they hate sin. As we read in Proverbs this, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. You hate sin if you fear God. Pride, arrogance, the evil way, and the perverted mouth, I hate. To fear God is to hate sin because God hates sin. That's the love and obedience that we're talking about here. Now here's a very strong statement made by Lex Meyer. He's a pastor in Oklahoma that I occasionally listen to. I think it's a really true statement. He says this, if you don't deal seriously with your own sin, you do not fear God. If you do not seriously deal with your sin, you do not actually fear God. I think it's a very true statement, and it ties into what we talked about last week about separation and change, about the act of becoming holy. The Apostle Paul talks about this when we read in 2 Corinthians this. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let's cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in what? The fear of God. Holiness and fear of God are connected. Our sanctification, we talked about that last week, our sanctification process involves the fear of God. Fear causes us to draw near to Him, which results in us living a life that pleases Him. To fear God is to love and to obey His commandments. We read about this in Deuteronomy 5. If only they had such a heart in them to fear me and keep all my commandments. Always. So that it would go well with them and with their sons forever. It will go well with you forever if you fear and keep all his commandments. That's what we're being told here in scripture. It's easy to understand. Right friends? Now, Holy Scripture again, over and over and over, tells us to fear God and not men. Your Savior, Jesus Christ, my Savior, Jesus Christ, tells us all directly this exact same concept. When we, re when we see our Messiah say this in Matthew, and do not be afraid of those who kill the body, the people, the world, right? Who are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear Him. Who's Him? God. Fear Him who is able to do what? To destroy both the soul and the body in hell. Your Savior, my Savior tells us, fear our Father. That's how much power He has. Now Jesus is telling us directly, do not fear anything in the world. Do not fear this pandemic. Do not fear the mankind that can do you harm. He is certainly saying, Maddox, don't fear those snakes. That's for sure what He's saying. Fear your Father is what our Savior says. So how do we do this fear of God thing, guys? What does it look like? Where do we start with fearing God? Well, the very first thing we need to do is to understand the power and the authority of God, not of man. The power and authority of God. When we understand exactly who God is and just how awesome He is, we will naturally fear Him. We will naturally want to love and obey Him. His power and authority are spoken of in the very first words from God that we read in the Bible. We find in Holy Scripture, in the very first sentence of the very first book, the display of authority and power of God when we read this. And everybody knows where we go. That's the first sentence of the book, of the Bible, right? In the beginning, God created the heavens and and the earth. God created everything. God created all things with His power. He spoke the words, let it be. That's what He said. Let it be. And guess what happened? It was. He spoke it and it was. There is no authority higher than this right here. None whatsoever. This is the highest authority 
ever. The second thing we need to do is seriously get into this right here. Serious business, guys, not just flippant. Seriously, get into the Word. We can obey our Father only when we understand what He desires for us. And that is found where? What does God desire for us? This is what He desires for us. This is what it tells us, both the Old and the New Testament. When we learn His commandments, His laws, which are His instructions to mankind on how to live a life that is pleasing to Him, and we obey Him, this is what God says to do, to love and obey Him. This is not what Brian is saying to do. This is what God says to do. Let me show you. We read in Deuteronomy this. You shall not listen to the words of that prophet or, the, or dreamer of dreams. You should not listen to people or men, right? For the Lord your God is testing you to find out whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You shall follow the Lord your God and do what? Fear Him. And you shall keep His commandments. Listen to His voice. Serve Him. And cling to Him. God is telling us how to do it. Brian's not telling you how to do it. By studying God's laws, we learn how to be holy and righteous, how to be changed and to be set apart from the world. It teaches us how to hate sin. The third thing we can do is to meditate on God's holiness. When we focus on His holiness, His attributes, His will, it will result in all of us, every one of us, having to deal with our own sinfulness. His will, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Seeing both His holiness and our sinfulness. When you look at His holiness and our sinfulness, we develop a healthy fear of God. And when we do this, friends, when we bow down to God, and when we learn who God is and we fear Him, we can now fully and truly understand His grace. And that's how it's connected. If you understand His power, His authority, and you fear Him, that's how you truly understand what His grace is. It is not debatable, friends. A person cannot fully understand the true love, compassion, and mercy of God and His Son, Jesus Christ, if they don't understand just how unworthy they are. You have to understand the predicament you're in to understand grace fully. God should, draw, God should destroy every one of us, friends. He should destroy every one of us because of our offenses against Him. When we understand that, we should fear God even more, right? Because we know what we truly deserve. Whoever wrote the song in Psalms 130 understands what I'm talking about here. This realization of our own sinfulness and God's mercy. When we read in Psalms 130 this. If you, Lord, should mark inequities, O Lord, who can stand? What is he saying? God is going to mark inequities. God is going to hold things against us. But there is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. It's connected, friends. The fear of God is connected to forgiveness. And we also need to remember that God will judge the wicked. He will make sure that those who do not fear Him before Judgment Day will certainly know that fear on Judgment Day. Because they'll know it one way or another. When we read in 2 Corinthians this, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive compensation for his deeds done through the body, in accordance with what he has done, whether good or bad. Therefore, knowing the what? The fear of the Lord. We persuade people, but we are well known to God. And I hope that we are also well known in your consciousness. You can't get away from this word, fear, friends, if you're intellectually honest study of the Bible. The judgment of God should invoke fear and terror in everyone's life. It should motivate believers to share the gospel with everyone who will listen. Because they need to escape the wrath of our Father. That's why we share it. We are reminded of this wrath. This wrath of God when we read in Hebrews 10 this. For we know Him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge His people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. Do you want to face the wrath of God? Because I don't. I don't want to face the wrath of God. 
God gives us a conclusion on this whole matter of fear, friends. And it's real simple. It doesn't matter what I say. And I'm, and I'm serious. It does not matter what I'm up here saying to you. It doesn't matter what any other preacher says to you. It doesn't matter what any human says to you, friends. What matters is what God says. What God says about fear. That is the truth. Let's read what his conclusion on this whole matter is when we read in Ecclesiastes this. The conclusion, the conclusion, when everything has been heard, is fear God, keep His commands, because this applies to every person. Every person. That's what God says. For God will bring every act to judgment, everything which is hidden, whether it's good or it's evil. It's doing the will of, of God, friends. This fear thing. It's the act of loving and obeying and fearing God. That old adage that we used to hear growing up about God-fearing Christians, it's a, it's a Western Christianity thing. It's been thrown out the door because we don't hear it anymore. We need to bring it back. We need to make sure that people that we talk to understand it because that's what God expects from us. That's what we're supposed to be doing. It needs to make a comeback so we can make sure that we focus correctly on God and not the world. Amen? Amen. Amen. At this time, let's remember our Savior with the Lord's Supper. Lynn, can I get your help, please? I was doing this every month like this. It's a tradition that I love. This is just... I, it is now so much a part of me that if we don't do it, there's going to be a problem. <laughs> okay. So, and that's probably thankful to those two people right there. So, thank you for doing and suggesting these kind of things. A call to worship, friends. God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall never perish. Let us remember our Savior with the Lord's Supper. Let us recite the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be Thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Why do we do this, friends? In the words of our Savior, Jesus of Nazareth, He explains this dynamic of Him being the bread of life, and His expectation for us, His flock. When we read in John 6 this, Truly, truly, I say to you, the one who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down out of heaven, so that anyone may eat from it and not die. I am the living bread that came down out of heaven. If anyone eats from this bread, he will live forever. And the bread which will I give for the life of the world also is my flesh. Then the Jews began to argue with one another, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourselves. The one who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. The one who eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, the one who eats me, he will also live because of me. This is the bread that came down out of heaven, not as the fathers ate and died. The one who eats this bread will live forever. I invite all of you who belong to Jesus Christ to remember Him by partaking in this Lord's Supper. Before you decide to partake, please reflect a moment on this following passage from the Apostle Paul. In 1 Corinthians 11 we read, Therefore whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup in the Lord in an unworthy way shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But a person must examine himself, and in doing so, he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Please take a moment to examine yourself.
If you truly belong to Jesus Christ, He is truly the Lord of your life, take joy in about what is going to happen here. Take joy, friends, in remembering exactly who Jesus Christ is and what He did for you. And He took the bread, and when He had given thanks, He broke it. And He gave it to them, saying, This is My body for which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of Me. Thank you, Father, for sending Your Son, Jesus Christ, to die for us so that we may live. And likewise, the cup, after they had eaten, saying, that cup, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Please partake. Praise God. Praise God. Our Holy Father, the Father that we fear, praise God for His gift to us, friends. For His gift, His plan of salvation, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, for giving us your Son, who is the true bread of life and sent from heaven for our salvation. We praise you, Father God, and you, Jesus Christ, for the love and mercy that you have given us. Please help us remember every day exactly what our Savior did for us when he took our sin, when he took that beating for us, and he cleansed us. Father, we ask for your strength in displaying your love as we go out in the world today and every day. Our neighborhood needs to see your love and compassion. Praise be to your holy, holy, holy name, Father. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Praise the Lord. The sermon today is that we learn a lot of mystery in our hearts and our lives and the way we receive Jesus Christ. So we need to understand that we don't particularly need to tremble for God.